Hello, my name is Elmer Towns. We've come to lesson number three in our study of soteriology. In this lesson, we're going to look at the whole area of Arminianism. Now, many of you are not Arminians, and you're going to turn me off. But I've already looked at Calvinism and its weaknesses, and now we're going to look at Arminianism and its weaknesses. I want you to think again of that railroad track. We're standing in the middle, and as far as we can see down the as far as we can see, they seem to come together. But when you get there, they never come together. Calvin can become a fatalist. Arminius can become to the other extreme. Let's pray and ask God to give us insight, to give us the right spirit, to give us the Holy Spirit. Father, we ask for the Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of truth. Speak to us the truth of systematic theology. We want to be as accurately as any human can be. We want to be as close to your heart, Lord, as we can be. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at the weaknesses of Arminianism. Here is a picture of Jacob Herman, also called Arminius. And when we look at it, it's a theological system that is attributed to Jacob Arminius. Now, his original name was Jacob Hermann. Now, that was his Dutch name, but he was known by his Latin name because in those days, all great scholars, all great scholars studied in Latin. And he was condemned by the Council of Dort. Remember in the last lecture, we looked at Dort because they felt, number one, he taught conditional salvation one could lose your salvation. Arminius believes that. I don't believe that. Number two, an incomplete view of sin. I think this is true of him. Number three, an emphasis on the experiential aspect of salvation while he neglected the non-experiential accomplishments of Calvary. I'll explain that later. And number four, the wrong in doctrine wrong interpretation of holiness. He felt, he felt that a man can become holy in his experience and that many who are the children of Arminius believe you can get to the place where you live above sin or you live without sin. Uh, or John Wesley said, you can have uh, pure love to God. Now, the Arminian doctrine was popularized by these men. When you begin to look at Christianity today, you can almost draw a line right down the very center. You who are Baptists think that everyone's a Calvinist and very few Armenians. That's not true. Matter of fact, maybe half of all Christians, when you think of all in the Pentecostal church, the Wesleyan church, the Holiness church, think in terms of the church of God. Maybe half of every believer in the world would fall under the Armenian point of view and the other half would fall under the Calvinistic point of view. And so you see John Wesley, the founder of the Wesleyan Church, Francis Asbury, the father of the Methodist Church in America, Charles Finney. Now, most holiness and Pentecostal denominations tend to be Arminian. Now, the author praises God for what has been accomplished by Arminians, but he also recognizes that orthodoxy is not always determined by one's success in ministry. What do I mean by that? The largest church in the history of Christianity is the Yoido Island Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea. They have three quarters of a million members. They have about 750,000 members. I've preached in that church. And the pastor, Yonggi Cho, is a friend of mine. That doesn't mean I agree with every point of view, but we are friends together. And you would say, well, if that's the largest church in the world, and look at all these big charismatic churches that are Armenian, doesn't that make it right? What, I did, what did we just say? That success in ministry does not always determine your orthodoxy, nor does orthodoxy always determine success in ministry. Actually, there is a substantial agreement in the basis or the fundamentals of the faith concerning Armenians and Calvinists. Let's look at these five fundamentals of the faith. The inerrancy of the Bible. The Bible is God's Word. It is accurate, authoritative for us. And so 
The first fundamentals of the Scripture is the Word of God. The second fundamental of the faith is the deity of Jesus Christ. He is God the Son. He is the Son of God. God at all times. God who died for our sins. The third is the vicarious. That means in our place, substitutionary. He took our sins upon Himself in His blood. We are born again. Number four, the physical resurrection, the same Jesus who died and was buried came up out of the grave in the same body. He was raised again on account of salvation to give us new life. And number four, the bodily or the physical return of Jesus Christ at the end to wrap up everything that's been done. Now, let me come back and say, quite often I preach at churches that would be called uh, an Armenian church. You say, why would you do that, Dr. Towns? Because I'm a fundamentalist. I agree to the fundamentals of the faith. But some say, I'm not a fundamentalist, and they will look at some rabble rouser, some Baptist church or independent church or narrow Presbyterian church down the street and say, they're fundamentalists. I don't want to be one. Well, don't identify yourself with those Always go back to the Word of God. So if you don't like the word fundamentalist, use the word essentials. The things that are essential to salvation, you take away one of these five fundamentals and you don't have Christianity. You take away the virgin birth and you no longer have Christianity. You take away the Word of God. If somebody denies one of these five, they can't be Christian. Because these five are essential. Now, let me put it like this. What does it take to make a car, an automobile, a car, an automobile? Well, you've got to have wheels. Those are essential. You've got to have a steering wheel. Those are essential. Now, a bumper is not essential. You can have a car without a bumper. And you don't need fenders, but you've got to have a fuel pump. You've got to have an engine. Yeah. You know, what must you have? Think of the essentials that make a car a car. And who needs a glove compartment or a trunk or a back seat? Now, here's an old phrase for you, a running board. <laughs> there are a lot of things you don't need. So when I begin to preach at a church, I will go to a church and I will speak in a church that has tongues. And somebody said, why would you go to a, a church that speaks in tongues? Because tongues is not one of the essentials. All right? I, I can, I, you can be my brother and you can happen to believe in baptism by sprinkling or baptizing babies. I don't happen to believe in that. But that's not the essential. That's like a gov compartment. That's something that we have added on. In essentials, harmony. In non-essentials, let's say love and respect. In all things, bring glory to God. Now let's go through and look at what... Arminius said and was we would consider wrong. The denial of original sin. Now he believed in sin, but I believe that we are born in sin. That makes us a sinner. There is a tendency among Armenians to deny or so define original sin as to practically deny its existence. Now what do we mean by that? Strong tells us what Armenians believe. Now he was not an Armenian, he was a Calvinist. According to this theory, all men as a divinely appointed sequence of Adam's transgression are naturally destitute of original righteousness and are exposed to misery and death. This inability, however, is physical and intellectual, but not voluntary. As a matter of justice, therefore, God bestows upon each individual from the first dawn of consciousness a special influence of the Holy Spirit which is sufficient to counteract the effect of the inherited depravity. Now, what does he mean by inherited depravity? The evil tendency and state may be called sin, but they do not in themselves involve guilt or punishment. That means if you're born in sin, that won't send you to hell. doesn't mean punishment. Still less is mankind accounted guilty of Adam's sin. God imputes to each man his inborn tendencies to evil. Now, I want you to take and put a circle around inborn tendencies. When you are born in sin, that means you have a tendency to evil. Now, this is what 
an Armenian believes, but I personally don't believe that. I believe you were born with sin. As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And David said it so aptly, in sin my mother conceived me. So we are born in sin. Now let's look at the answer. While the Bible teaches sin is implied to all, imputed, excuse me, imputed to all men, and all men are born with a sin nature, experiential, according to Arminius, a man becomes a sinner only when he consciously and voluntarily sins, thus appropriating the sin nature of Adam. Now, I think because you were born, you get Adam's sin nature. And Arminius says, when you sin, you get the sin nature. Now follow me carefully. Do you sin because you have a sin nature, or do you have a sin nature because you sin? What comes first? I think the Armenians have it backwards. They redefine sin in such a narrow limits as to deny all sin except voluntary transgression. What is sin? When you choose to sin, that's sin. Notice what John Wesley said. Nothing is sin, strictly speaking, but a voluntary transgression of a known law of God. Now, I want you to circle two words. Circle the word voluntary right there. You have to do it and choose to do it, but you have to know the law of God. So, Wesley would not say that ignorant sin is sin, when you sin ignorantly. But later we'll say that is sin. Now, notice the second. The biblical definition of sin includes volitional sin, ignorant sin, and sin nature. So here's where we disagree with the Wesleyans. Now the second thing, they deny the completed work of Christ in salvation that guarantees salvation for those who receive it. Now Wesley concludes, two things are certain. The one, that it is possible to lose even the pure love of God. The other, that it is not necessary. Now when you see the word pure love of God, to John Wesley, that means the ability to live without sin. When, uh, when John, when, when we read the hymn, O love that will not let me go, uh, that's a love that's keeping us from sin, according to the, the hymn writer. One of the implications of the denial of the security of the believer is a redefinition of the completed work of Christ. What do I mean by that? The Armenians don't, they don't believe once saved, always saved. They don't believe that. Why? Because they have redefined what Christ has done. We say Christ has taken away all sin forever and given us eternal life. All right. Since God has completed His work and since the believer has given God's nature and has life that is eternal, how could God abolish a completed agreement? When God makes an agreement to give us, how could God abolish that agreement and take away salvation? We'd say He couldn't. The idea that Christ would save and then allow a convert to lose what he did not merit or achieved in repentance causes one to question not only his good work, but also his good intention, God's good intention. Number three, the third, the method of keeping salvation. Armenians make some work on their part necessary to retain salvation. Now the Armenians believe you can sin away the day of grace. If you, Armenians always love to say, well, what about so-and-so who went out and committed adultery knowing it was wrong? Did God save him? No, he lost his salvation. What about somebody who says, I hate God, but yet they say they were born again? What's the answer? Paul answers, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? It's not the flesh that saves us, it's the Holy Spirit. We have begun in the Holy Spirit. Number two, if it is possible for an individual to somehow fall away from grace, it therefore stands that that same individual, if he does not fall away, must be somehow at least be responsible for the retention of his salvation. Now, this is logic. Here it is. If it's possible 
for you to fall away, then that also means it's possible for you to stay saved. Therefore, if you can do something to lose it, you can do something to keep it. And we know that salvation is all of God. You cannot do anything to get it except believe. And once you are saved, all you have to do is believe and you will be saved forever. Now, what, what causes people to lose their salvation? We're going to look at this one quote by a well-known Arminian. The six sins which are accounted of old to be forerunners of the sin against the Holy Spirit. Now, when they say you sin against the Holy Spirit, you will lose your salvation. Are presumption of God's mercy, obstinance in sin, impenitence, despair of salvation, imputing known truth, and envy at another's grace. Let's put this in everyday terminology. What causes the loss of salvation? We, we who are Calvinists don't always understand the mind of an Armenian. What causes them to lose their salvation? All right, let's walk with them. To move from salvation by acts. That means if you, uh, if you sin by an act, if you don't tithe when you're supposed to, if you, you can move from salvation by acts. Number two, to sin away grace. Now, number one really says when you don't do what you're supposed to do, to go to church, to love God. And number two, to sin away grace. That means if you cuss, if you steal, if you cheat on your exam, cheat on your income tax, if you do any of these sins, you can lose your salvation. Now, in some churches that are Armenian, uh, I forget, <laughs> i got to tell you this story. First time I preached for John Maxwell, uh, he had a, this large uh, Armenian church, Armenian in theology, and John is, he's kind of halfway, he's a Calvinian. He says he's a Calvinist Armenian, so he calls himself a Calvinian. And I preached, and we had a great altar, about 14 people at the altar. And so he had a sheet of paper, and he took this sheet of paper, I'll use this, he said, Elmer, look at this. And he showed me how many came for rededication, how many came to uh, join the church, how many came for salvation. Then he covered up the, he said, you don't want to see the last part. I said, what's that? He said, you don't want to see it. So I reached over, took his hand away. How many came to be saved again? <laughs> and he said, you don't believe that the people could be saved again. I said, that's right. He said, but even though you don't believe it, God can do it. I said, if they were saved again, they were saved for the first time. And so we disagree on this, and we have remained good friends over the years. You can sin. These people had been saved. They sinned. They got saved again, according to him. To cease following Christ. The Armenian says, if you don't follow Christ, you'll fall away and lose your salvation. You'll fall away into hell. You'll become a prodigal to deny the work of Calvary. Those people who stand up and say, I don't believe the blood of Jesus Christ. And the, the Armenian says, how can God take to heaven a man who spits in his face and says, I don't believe the blood of Jesus Christ and blasphemes the death of Christ. How can God take him? I say that man was probably not saved in the first place. And to apostatize. Now to John Maxwell, my good friend who calls himself a Calminian. He says, I don't believe that sin causes you to lose your salvation. I don't think that sins of omission or sins of rebellion or sins of ignorance take away salvation. But if you apostatize to teach the opposite of Christianity, to teach, to apostatize is to teach apostasy. Apostasy is the opposite of the fundamentals of the faith. The Bible is not the Word of God. You're going to teach the Bible is myth and error. Jesus is not the Son of God. He's just a man. The death of Jesus Christ was not for the blood. And so to apostatize is to teach the opposite. And John Maxwell says, if you believe that, you will lose your salvation. Number five the confusion of salvation and sanctification. Now, where am I? 
I am talking about the weaknesses of Arminianism. The idea of perfection as a post-Christian experience. They said that if you were not born with a sin nature, which you can choose to sin, you can choose to do away with sin, and since you don't have a sin nature, you can be perfect. Oh, okay. The experience is known under various terms, including the second blessing, the second work of grace, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, eradication, perfection, salvation from sin, entire sanctification. John, John uh, Wesley called it, oh, perfect love. Now, there's a few other phrases, but they believe in the first work of grace, salvation, and a second work of grace that makes you perfect. Salvation, the first work of grace, takes care of all past sins, but that second work of grace makes you able not to sin, able to live without sin, able to live above sin, Let's look at the answers. A misunderstanding of the non-experiential work of Christ for the believer in heaven. The Armenian doesn't understand that Christ is in heaven right now. He's the intercessor at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for Elmer. According to Hebrews 7, chapter 24, he's the man of the glory who makes intercession. Every time I sin, Jesus said, oh God, forgive him. He's the intercessor and he's the advocate. Now, 1 John 2, 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. What's the advocate? The word advocate is a lawyer. A lawyer goes into court and gets, keeps you out of jail and keeps you out of jail. A lawyer argues on your behalf. And Jesus says at the right, oh God, forgive Elmer Town for his sin. Wrong view of regeneration. Now, this is the sixth argument against Arminianism. They don't understand regeneration. Now, remember I said the door. Remember that door? On one side is conversion. On the other side is regeneration. Conversion is what you must do. It's intellect, emotion, and will. You convert, God regenerates. Let's look at what Hodge says about regeneration. Regeneration is an inseparable part of the Armenian system, following necessarily from their view of election, of the design and effect of Christ's death, and of sufficient grace and free will, that those who were once justified and regenerated may, by neglecting grace and grieving the Holy Spirit, fall into such sins as are inconsistent with true justifying faith, and, continuing and dying in the same, may consequently finally fall into perdition? The answer, regeneration is a work of God, not a work of man. Therefore, no man has the ability to change God's work nor its fundamental existence. Now, again, let's look at the store. Look at the store now. The door on one side is to convert. You know, you feel, you act. One side is and you say, God, I want salvation. I want to be saved. It's what you do. On the other side is what God does. When God regenerates because you convert, you are saved forever. What God does cannot be undone. What you do over here, you can, you know, that's you on your side. But remember the door has two sides. I remember when I was in Sunday school, we used to sing the song, one door and only one, and yet its sides are two, inside and outside, on which side are you? One door and only one, and yet its sides are two, I'm on the inside, on which side are you? Now, one door, one side is convert, regenerate, and when the door swings, both sides, regeneration is to give you eternal life, and eternal lasts forever. Creating new life is the prerogative of God. God creates a new nature, gives it eternal life, and what you do cannot erase it. Wrong view of the union with Christ. Now, let's look at this. This is one of those non-experiential aspects of salvation. 
Armenians define a union between Christ and Christians as a merely moral union or a union of love and sympathy like that between a teacher and scholar or friend and friend. So what is the union with Christ? The Bible says, I am in Christ and Christ is in me. The vine and the branches, ye in me and I in you. What does it mean to be in Christ? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What does that word in Christ mean? Answer. The Bible teaches an organic union where the believers are one in Christ and partakers of his divine nature. Now, in so many of my places, so many of my teaching, I come back to this phrase, in Christ. To be in Christ is to be placed into him. And I talk about union and communion. When you get saved, you are put into Christ in heaven. That's called union. The second thing is communion. Christ comes into your heart. Now, in uh, John 14, 20, 21, John 15, 3, John 15, 5, ye in me and I in you. What does that mean? Jesus repeats it very quickly. Ye in me and I in you. Ye in me means I am in Christ in heaven and I in you means Christ is in me. When I ask Christ to come into my heart, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm given eternal life. Christ comes in. Ye in me and I in you. Christ is saying, I'm going to come into you, but you are in me in heaven. Double transference. Great truths. Wrong view of the nature of grace. We believe that in the grace of God, God counsels every charge against you. Everything you've ever done is gone. I remember the little story I used to tell when teaching children. I told the story of the teacher who went to the chalkboard and wrote on the chalkboard, sin, S. I in. He said, when you disobey God, it's called a sin. When you cuss, S-I-N will send you to hell. When you lie, S-I-N will send you to hell. When you steal, S-I-N will send you to hell. And then the teacher took the eraser and said, see, God in Jesus forgives you and wipes out. The little boy saw that. And there was a door, and the door led to the cloakroom back of the chalkboard. And the boy ran over, looked back, and he said, where'd it go, where'd it go? He said, teacher said, where'd what go? He said, sin, when you erased it, where did it go? It went away. Did it go back there? No, it's completely gone. You don't understand that when Jesus died, he completely took away sin. That's the nature of grace. Where did it go? He didn't put it in a footlocker that he can bring it out and hold it up against you when you appear before the judgment seat of Christ and say, oh, you've got this sin, you can't come in. Now, remember what I said in the last lesson. You don't go to hell for sin. You go to hell for unbelief. And therefore, every sin that you've ever done, every sin that you've ever done, those sins Jesus died for, Remember, he was the substitute for all sin. He not only was the sub, he paid the price for all sins, redemption for all. He not only redeemed all, he died for all. And then we look at, you know, he was the law. The law for all was taken out of the way. He, he was the propitiation for the world for all. And he actually paid the price for every sin. There's no more sin. So the Armenians don't really understand the full meaning of grace. Grace is the exact opposite of what you deserve. God canceled every charge against the sinner and God dismissed every human responsibility to himself. Everything that you have to do for God, God has dismissed. You say, boy, that's pretty big of God. That is God. So what's the conclusion? Mullins... Here, you see a picture of him. Mullins was a theologian about 100 years ago. Not Calvinist, not Armenian. I like the guy. He's pretty close to where I am. You'll notice I quote him a lot. 
Now the New Testament avoids the pantheistic tendency of extreme Calvinism and the deistic tendency of extreme Arminianism. Amen. The New Testament teaching and the Christian experience are completely one in keeping the divine and human aspects properly related to each other. I believe that. All right, let's go now into the plan of salvation. We know it's not Calvinism, it's not Arminianism. God says, I have a plan for people to get to heaven. God has a plan. What is that plan? I went to Columbia Bible College, September 1950. The first Saturday night I was there, there was nothing to do. And I was sitting in my room. I didn't know what to do. And I was just kind of sitting there and came a knock at the door. It was Jack C. Jack had been a merchant marine in World War II, studying for ministry. I don't know what ever happened to Jack. He came by and said, what are you doing? Nothing. Let's go down to the bus station and let's witness. I didn't know how to witness. I didn't know how to share my faith. I didn't have been saved less than two months. I said, okay. So we go down to a track rack and there was this orange track called the Roman Road of Salvation. It had a picture of a road on it and it was orange and black, almost Halloween. And it had four verses. And so he stood there in the hallway and said, now here's how you get someone saved. God has four steps on this road. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to teach you exactly what Jack C. taught me standing in that hallway in Columbia Bible College. And he said, we'll go to the bus station. What I'm telling you, you go sit down by someone, show them this track. I had my Bible. He said, show them this track and read it to them and ask them if they want to get saved. If they do, pray with them to lead them to Christ. I had never done that. He said, if they got questions and they don't know what to say, come get me, I'll come and answer their questions. So don't worry, don't get nervous. I said, okay. And I don't know what happened that night. I don't know if I led anyone to Christ. I don't know if I got, I just, all I remember is I thought this is a good way to get people saved. What do you need to know? First of all, you, you need a knowledge that you need salvation. The first thing you need to know you're saved. People do not turn to God unless they have a sense of their need. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your Bible. Okay, camera, come in real close so you can see this. I want you to get your Bible and I want you to do what I've done. You see, there's the verse and I've blocked it in with a ballpoint pen and I took a highlighter and I colored it in and when I'm leading someone to Christ at Thomas Road Baptist Church, I have done this hundreds and hundreds of times over the years. I'll say, all right, see this verse? Read it out loud together. Read it to me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I point to that first word, all. Everybody has sinned. Does that include you? Yes, that includes me. I put myself with them. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that means you can't go to heaven. You've come short. You've fallen short. It's kind of like I said, if I ask you to jump to the top of the church building, can you do it? No, I'd fall short. You can't, you can't please God. You fall short. And so for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the first thing you need to know. All right. The second thing you need to know, let's come back to our screen you need to know the knowledge of the penalty of sin. And under the penalty of sin, because a man is a sinner, he must pay the penalty for sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, take your Bible and turn over to, to uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Come in real close camera, I want you to see this. And I point to this verse. Notice again, I've got it uh, blocked out with a ballpoint pen and I've got it highlighted. I want you to do this so that when you are talking to an unsaved person, their eyes will go right here and it won't wander all over the page. Why? Because when you point, you can focus. The wages of sin is death. And I point out, I said, when you work all week, what do you get? And if you point to that word, they'll say wages. All right, the wages of sin, you work for sin, what do you get? 
And I point to that word and they'll say death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift, what's a gift? What's a Christmas gift? Well, that's something that a friend gives you. They like you. It's something you don't deserve. They give it to you at birthdays. So the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I say, now what's the difference between wages and gift? I always tell the story. Suppose you work all week. You work hard, and Friday at pay time, you come and you ask, and the boss says, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you your paycheck because I really like you. You can say, no, don't give me my paycheck. You owe me my paycheck. I work for it. I, it's mine. I, I, you owe it. I deserve it. When you work for sin, you deserve hell. The, again, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now let's come and look, go to the third screen. Knowledge of God's provision. The first thing, the third thing I saw in that tract as Jack C., that older student, showed me. He said, the third thing you want to tell them is that God has provided for your sin. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All right, now, come in real close again, and notice again, I have it colored in my Bible. Why? So people can see it. But God commendeth. That's a hard word to understand. Old English, it means God gave. God gave what? His love to us, to me. That's to you, to me. And that while we were yet sinners, all right? We, the wages of sin is death. While we were a sinner, on our way to hell, death, Christ died for us. That's the gospel. You don't have to die. Jesus died for you. Isn't that good news? That's the gospel. That's good news. Jesus died for you. So the wages of sin is death. We're all sinners, but Christ died for us. All right, let's go to the fourth one now. You must respond. And so you turn to Romans 10, and you again look at what the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now what is it? that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, you can say it with your mouth, and that's not enough. Remember, I told you as a little boy, I said I believed in Jesus with my mouth. I said it with my head. Why? Because I knew it in my head, but that was not enough. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And what you have to do is it has got to go from head to heart. You've got to believe that if you will believe from your heart, you shall be saved. This is the Roman road of salvation. Have you been saved? Have you asked Christ to come into your heart? If you haven't ever done it, I'm going to pray right now, and I want you to pray with me this prayer. Lord Jesus, I've never done it before. I've never asked you to come into my heart and make me a Christian. So right now, Lord, I ask Jesus come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. Make me a Christian. And I will serve you. And I will... I will become a Christian and join a church and I will be your servant. I will follow you for the rest of my life. And I pray these, Jesus, in your name, amen. Now, if you pray that with all of your heart, you can be saved and you can be saved forever for eternity. It's as simple as that. That's salvation. We come to the end of this lesson. We've now looked at three things, salvation, Calvinism, Arminianism, and now we're going to move into other aspects of salvation in our next lesson. May God bless you as you continue to study His Holy Word.